Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thanks for staying with us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. As at Friday, March the 19th, there were more than 122 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally. About 69 million people have recovered all over the world and the death toll is over 2.7 million. In Nigeria, there were over 161,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. More than 147,000 people had recovered and 2,027 people have died in the country. That's about 1,200 new infections in the week and about 3,500 recoveries. Recovery rate is up to about 91% and case fatality rate is still 1.25. Total samples tested are over 1.68 million. That's more than 82,000 new tests in a week. A good feat. One thing about tuberculosis and COVID-19 that they have in common is that they both primarily attack the lungs. Some of the symptoms look alike, like cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. According to the World Health Organization, 63 million lives have been saved through the global end TB effort since 2000. But what has happened since COVID-19 came on? My guest is a consultant physician, Dr. Oidamola Awufisoye. He joins us from our Abuja studio. You're welcome to the show. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Now, we've spoken about some of the similarities between the symptoms of COVID-19 and TB, as we like to call tuberculosis. Are there other similarities and what are the differences? Um, like you rightly said, uh, tuberculosis and COVID-19 are infections that primarily affect the lungs. And of course, there are a lot of similarities be between them. Uh, both of them can cause cough, both of them can cause shortness of breath, they can cause a fever, and uh, they can cause reduction in the lung function and cause someone to be quite sickly. Um, but that's most of the similarities. Uh, generally speaking, tuberculosis is an indolent disease, disease. that is, it uh, has a long process of incubation before there's a clinical disease, and it can be in the lung for a very long time, even without any symptom or before this person began, begin to show symptoms. Unlike COVID-19, that is generally speaking, a acute respiratory illness. Of course, COVID-19 is also a viral illness, whereas tuberculosis is caused by a bacterial uh, organism. Um, uh, of course, the two of them affect the lungs in just different ways like that. And uh, uh, a lot of the problem we have these days, of course, is that uh, the appearance of COVID-19 on the scene has actually altered uh, the response, uh, the NTB response, so to say. So has altered the response to the tuberculosis campaign and has actually dented some of the achievements we've made over the years uh, in curtailing tuberculosis. Uh, how, how did it dent it? Um, of course, uh, COVID-19 has, has brought a lot of changes. And uh, number one, because of the little stigma associated with COVID-19, a lot of people hide their cough. People are afraid to cough in public. People are afraid. People were afraid to present to the hospital with cough and respiratory related illness uh, because of fear of being uh, thought to have COVID-19. And therefore, uh, the case detection rate for tuberculosis has actually reduced. Uh, so that's one. And uh, apart from that, with the global disruptions in uh, normal day-to-day -day activities and normal business, business activities, that has also affected uh, many tuberculosis treatment centers, supply chain of medications, and uh, even healthcare-seeking behavior of people. So uh, the rate at which uh, tuberculosis is being detected, particularly in the countries that are high burden for tuberculosis, is actually much less. So we're picking less, uh, they're picking less cases in such uh, tuberculosis centers, and that's just because of such disruptions uh, caused by COVID-19. Aside from that, of course, there's a funding issue uh, when something like COVID-19 crops up, uh, governments often have to divert a lot of funds to it, and that means some funds that will have been made available for things related to tuberculosis campaign uh, would be kind of diverted uh, towards that. And of course, apart from 
uh, people's healthcare seeking behavior and that. Uh, even healthcare workers, uh, many patients that well, we should investigate thoroughly as it could be tuberculosis, will easily be, be quickly labeled that it could be COVID and then uh, it's just they don't bother to do the uh, detailed work to identify what's actually causing this person's cough or shortness of breath. Time was when um, if somebody had tuberculosis, it was a big deal. You know, they, they practice extreme physical distancing. It was like a death sentence, you know. And I, be, I, I, I believe there was some sort of stigma too. How did doctors get over this? How did they um, end the stigma or has it even ended? Uh, well, I, I will happily say that the stigma associated with tuberculosis has reduced over the years. And uh, I've seen patients, even recently, by the time I told them that the diagnosis is tuberculosis, they did not flinch. And that's not the way it was, let's say something as, soon, as recent as 10 years ago. So the stigma associated with the disease tuberculosis has greatly reduced, even though it is still there, and there's still a lot of more work to be done, done in that regard. And uh, I think it's more of related to the health campaigns has been done, uh, educating the public, uh, making tuberculosis treatments obviously available and making it obvious to people that the treatment is efficacious, that it works, such that you know that if you have tuberculosis now, if you get the standard treatment, which typically lasts for six months now, uh, you, don't, you won't likely have tuberculosis in another six months time. So when people have seen the tre treatability of that and, uh, that, and uh, uh, people living a healthy, people being healthy who are receiving the treatment. I think that's part of the things that has uh, made people more open to tuberculosis. And I will say now that people are even, uh, with the current stigma with COVID-19 now, people are even more uh, afraid of COVID-19 more than tuberculosis now. They shouldn't really be afraid of either of the two, actually. So uh, such progress has been made regarding tuberculosis, uh, regarding the perception of the public uh, relating to tuberculosis. 46 months is a long time. That's almost two years. Do, do people get tired of no, taking I said their six meds? Months. Oh, six months. Okay, <laughs> that's a whole lot six better. Months. But it's every day for six months, right? Don't people get tired? Yes, every day for six months. It's still very long, actually. So is anything being long, done to shorten the time? Give uh, a lot of encouragement for people to go through with that treatment. Unfortunately, we still have a lot of people not completing their treatment. That's still an issue. And that's one of the main reasons why we have the drug resistance with tuberculosis. It's a slow growing organism. And because it's a slow growing organism, uh, the treatment that can really clear it has to be a very prolonged treatment with multiple antibiotics, uh, which can be burdensome to take. But with the right education and the right encouragement, uh, a lot of patients are able to take it without any so much issues and fortunately the drugs are relatively well toler tolerated uh, but yes it's a six month course of treatment and people often have challenges completing that six months but we with the right encouragement and with the right education uh, a lot of people are able to do it uh, without so much assholes but thankfully speaking uh, the response of the vast majority of people with tuberculosis to the medication is still very excellent and uh, it's only a few cases that we, in a few cases that we get the drug resistance issue, but uh, it's a growing problem, I must admit, and uh, that's which we need to do more about. Yeah, I wanted to talk about the drug resistant thing. Almost half a million people came down with drug resistant, uh, multi-drug resistant TB in 2019. What is it looking like now? Are you winning the fight? Because look, NTB has less than two years to go. The NTB target. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you sound really especially sad. concerning the <laughs> recent COVID-19 pandemic and it, the, the way it disrupted the tuberculosis campaign, uh, it's looking less likely that we're going to meet the target of NTB by the end of uh, 2022. Uh, that being said, uh, the drug resistance, the problem of drug resistance in tuberculosis is increasing by the day. That is the truth. It's increasing by the day. And uh, it is thought that, uh, number one, the doing diagnostic tests to identify drug resistance among patients with tuberculosis is not something that has 
uh, penetrated adequately. So that means uh, the ability, the capacity to do the test is not as much as uh, we want, it, we would have wanted it to be as available. Uh, the gene expert test, which can help us identify drug resistance in tuberculosis on time, uh, is still not being adequately used. It's not, a lot of centers still don't have them available. So it means that a lot of resistant cases are not being identified. And we know that a person can get resistant TB by two means. The first mean is by the person having a regular TB before, but because the medication use were not optimal or the person did not use it as regularly as he or she should have, uh, the person can develop drug resistance. That's what we call, uh, uh, so that's a form of drug resistance. On the other hand, someone can acquire drug most drug resistance TB ab initio from another person. Uh, that second pathway of acquiring an already resistant pathogen one of the key strategies to reduce it is by uh, reducing the amount of people in the population that has uh, the drug resistant type. And that means you have to identify them and then you have to treat them with the, uh, what we call the second line regimens. So uh, there's still a lot to be done in that regard. And uh, I agree that uh, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis is one of the big threats to this uh, NTB campaign. Do you, have you considered uh, treating TB the way COVID is treated sometimes. I mean, they have um, home care, home-based care for some people. They take their drugs, they have a care package and all that. Is that feasible? Or can you treat your TB patient and send him off to work? Um, um, in, in uh, okay, so the approach of treating both COVID and TB is actually quite different. Uh, for COVID, of course, some people will be admitted just because of to reduce the risk of spreading. A lot of people will have their treatments at home. For TB, generally, the treatment is at from home, generally, except for very sick patients. And of course, for multi-drug resistant TB is a is an inpatient treatment. The patient has to be admitted for that because uh, we cannot afford for that to be spread to the public. So the person is admitted for a, a large chunk of the cost of the treatment. Uh, for the multi-drug resistant TB. But for the regular tuberculosis, it's actually treatment from home usually, except if the person is very sick. Uh, but what we usually advocate, or what has been advocated before, particularly in some kind of settings, is uh, the what we call the direct, ob direct observed uh, treatment uh, system, dots. in which uh, the person goes somewhere to collect the medication, and the person takes the medication on spot there. Okay, but that's not very feasible for a lot of people. So that's reserved only for high risk situations now. But what is usually practiced is that the patient takes a medication for a certain aliquot of period per time, maybe seven days, uh, maybe one week to two weeks, and the person comes back intermittently. And that means when the person defaults from the treatment, that's when the person stops coming from the medication, and uh, so the person has to be traced such that uh, you find out what the problem is, and then so that the treatment is not interrupted. Uh, as much as possible. So most people with tuberculosis actually get treated from home, except when it's multi-drug resistant. And that's in the case in which uh, the person has to be in an, on admission somewhere. Okay, so here's what I want to know. For somebody who has regular tuberculosis, can you treat the person, uh, must you finish the treatment before the person can go back into the population, maybe go back to work or something? Or can you at some point say, Okay, you, can, you will no longer spread it if you're with people, but you must be taking your medication. Um, so, okay, so, in strict terms, uh, when someone has completed about two weeks of the medication and a lot of the symptoms have reduced, usually we consider the person to, uh, to have less chances of spreading it, okay? Uh, in people in which the risk of spreading is much higher, either they have what we call cavitating disease in the, in the, in the lungs, or they're producing, still producing quite some sputum. Uh, ideally, once you actually do the sputum, uh, do a test on the sputum, that's the, uh, what they cough up, the flame they cough up again, yes. to see that the bacteria is no longer active there. And when, once that is done, actually the risk of spread is actually much less. But in practice, by the time they've completed the drugs for at least two weeks, the chance of spreading it is much, much lower. Uh, but there are some more higher risk situations. So someone who has babies at home, uh, who has older people at home, or people who are at more risk. In such situations, uh, it's more ideal to 
test and see that this person is no longer sputum positive, as we call it, before we allow the person to mingle with such people again. Okay, we're going to take a short break right now. We'll be back shortly. Please stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking about tuberculosis in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is Channels Television and this is Health Matters. The number to call if you have a question on TB is 0808-054-2233. It should be showing on your screen now. You can also tweet at CTV underscore Mary A with questions or comments. We'll go back to the doctor now. And I want to ask, uh, ask doctor, have you seen any patients who had TB and also got COVID-19? Um, not really, but I've seen patients who are on treatment for TB existing and are tested positive for COVID-19. Um, the one I remember just had a slight worsening of his symptom, and, uh, but really nothing so much. And uh, so that's, uh, but people acquiring both TB and COVID-19 at the same time, um, I've not seen any, any such one, okay? So, but I've seen people who are on treatment for tuberculosis who caught COVID-19 with minimal symptoms. I've seen people, of course, quite a number of these who have had TB before, who have been killed of the tuberculosis, but still has residual uh, scarring and uh, what we call fibrosis in the lungs and are now caught uh, COVID-19 as well. But in this case, the TB is not active. Uh, it's just the COVID-19 that is happening on an already existing uh, lung that is scarred. Uh, but it's possible for someone to have both tuberculosis and COVID-19. Uh, in that case, usually to be an existing tuberculosis with someone that is now just acquiring COVID-19. Okay, but uh, it would be unusual for someone to be diagnosed afresh with tuberculosis and COVID-19 at the same time. It's probably one of the two rather than the two. Okay. Um, does this tuberculosis have risk factors for contracting? Are there some things that make some people more prone to getting it? Absolutely. So, uh, yes, there are risk factors for contracting tuberculosis. And the first thing is uh, living in an environment that is endemic for tuberculosis, an environment where TB is very common. Because the more TB you have in your environment, then the more likely any individual person is to catch it. And of course, we know that Nigeria and Saharan Africa is a, is a TB endemic environment. We have one of the highest burdens in the world. And that means uh, everybody in Nigeria is already at risk of catching tuberculosis, starting with that. Additionally, extremes of age, very young people, that's children whose immunity has not yet been quite developed. And then much older people too, whose immunity has started to wane, are more likely to be allowed to catch tuberculosis. Let, also, let me pause you there for the a second. BCG vaccine, which is. Let me pause you there for a second which and is, uh, take Mukaila on the line. We have a call from Mukaila. Hello, Mukaila. Okay, Mukaila, try again. We've lost Mukaila for a second. Please continue, doctor, with the risk factors. Yes, uh, so at the extreme of age, so when the immune, uh, immune capacity begins to wane due to old age, so older people and very young children are at a higher risk. People who did not collect have the BCG vaccination are more likely to acquire more severe tuberculosis. Also, many medical conditions, including uh, diabetes mellitus, HIV AIDS, uh, increases one chances of contracting tuberculosis and makes it more likely to be symptomatic and to be severe. Additionally, people who have certain cancers, uh, people are on certain medications that are used to modulate the immune system because of some medical conditions are also high risk of uh, catching tuberculosis. So I think those are some of the common risk factors for tuberculosis. And of course, people who stay in uh, overcrowded environments, people who live in slums in which uh, you're more likely to have uh, six people packed like sardine in a small space are more likely to contract tuberculosis as well. Uh, unfortunately, there's also some social aspects to it. So people who are uh, in the lower structure of the socioeconomic status are actually at a higher risk of contracting tuberculosis as well. 
Speaking so, of so that, those are some BCG, of the risk factors. Yes, thank you. Speaking of the BCG vaccine, we've been taking it for so long. One would have thought that by now we would have ended TB. What, what's the dynamic? Why do we still have TB hanging around? Uh, well, t BCG vaccine is not uh, really efficacious in preventing TB. It's more likely to reduce the severity of the, of the, of the disease. So, is, um, t tuberculosis is not really a vaccine preventable disease. It's more of a vaccine amendable disease. I think it's better to look at it like that. So, that's why someone uh, who had the BCG vaccine can very well still have tuberculosis. It's just like it's a bit more like less likely to be severe, particularly in childhood. So, of course, a lot of things affect the dynamics of of acquiring tuberculosis. Why we still have tuberculosis with us, and uh, drug resistance uh, and HIV is actually I, I think it's part of the key uh, things that are driving the persisting or the persisting uh, burden of the TB pandemic. Drug resistance, okay. HIV, AIDS uh, are making uh, TB more of a bigger problem than just have been. Let's quickly take Alex from Abuja. Hello, Alex. Hello. What do you have for us? Yeah, um, I want to be sure about... Uh... Hello. Go on. You need to put your TV off. Your volume is howling back. Okay, I'm just trying to be uh, to be sure about the TB and the and the Corona as well. What effect does TB has on coronavirus? Okay, thank How you. How vulnerable Alex. it is to TB. Okay, thank you. So, doctor, let's let's take okay, that so to you. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question very well. Uh, what effect does tuberculosis has on coronavirus? This is how bad would the COVID-19 be if somebody already had TB before he got it? Oh, yeah. So, so okay. So, so it's likely to be worse. Um, anybody with pre-existing lung condition, and TB is a pre-existing lung condition, and acquires a superimposed COVID in this case now, uh, the COVID is more likely to be worse in that person than it will have been if the person did not have uh, tuberculosis before. So it's likely to be worse. But how worse it is, it's not, it doesn't, it's not so, it's not dramatic, but it's a bit worse than it will have been. And the most carrying the person has existing in the lung from the tuberculosis, then the worse uh, the COVID will be. Uh, the other interesting thing that just adds to that angle is that uh, earlier in the pandemic, it was thought or it was considered that countries where BCG vaccine, vaccinations uh, were still ongoing or was in existence, uh, it appeared as though coronavirus uh, was less devastating there. Okay, but that was not conclusive by any means. So uh, there's no clear-cut evidence for that. Okay, but anybody with a pre-existing lung condition, either from tuberculosis or from anything else, actually the COVID will be a bit worse than it will have been. Okay, so quickly, should somebody who has tu tuberculosis, active tuberculosis, take the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, okay, so that's a difficult one. The way I'll answer that is that uh, we don't have a very clear evidence that suggests that uh, it will be harmful. So people that have ongoing tuberculosis can take other vaccines. And there's no reason why we should think that taking COVID vaccine could be harmful for them. Uh, there's no, of course, we're still learning a lot about COVID. We're still learning a lot about the vaccination and the effects. Uh, there's nothing that suggests that there should be any issues with that. So I think that someone who has active ongoing tuberculosis can receive the COVID vaccine. Let's there's quickly no take this call from Chris. For now. Sorry to cut in. Let's quickly take this call from Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello, ma. Good afternoon, ma. Good afternoon. What's your question? Oh, I've been listening to your program. Uh, the doctor talked about TB. He mentioned about the symptoms of the lungs. But he never talked about TB of the bones. And there was a time someone told me that it's something like TB of the bones. I started suffering from some challenges with my spine. I woke up in the morning with the spine around the waist a bit swollen. And then uh, the pains at the middle, the pains towards the neck. So someone was now saying that could be 
caused by TB of the bones. I never heard of that in my Thank life. Thank you so much, Chris. Like that exists. Thank you, Chris. Doctor, can you quickly, in one minute, tell us about TB of the bones? Uh, so TB can affect any tissue in the body, actually. TB can affect every part of the body. So TB of the bone happens, and the, one of the commonest sites of the bones that we, can, that we see is of the spine, usually affecting the middle, mid-back, okay? And sometimes it can lead to uh, angulation of the spine, so that there's a sharp pointing part of the back, pointing out, uh, that we call a gibbous medically. And that's can sometimes lead to weakness in the leg and paralysis of the legs. So we see TB of the bones, and the commonest part affected in the bones is the spine. Now, the symptoms the person described, of course, we best evaluated in a healthcare facility, but uh, back pain and back issues are very common. Uh, perhaps less than one out of 100 back issues will be related to TB. So it's probably unlikely that that back issue is related to tuberculosis, uh, but tuberculosis does occur in the backbone in the bones, including the backbone, and typically can cause pain Thank and you, uh, doctor. I'm going to have to bending stop you of there. the spine, at, usually at the mid-back. Thank you so much. Sorry to cut in. I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there. With this last word for Chris, please go and have yourself evaluated at the hospital and be sure about what's going on. Thank you so much, doctor, for coming to the show. We appreciate it so very much. Thank you, Mukaila, Chris, and thank you, Alex, for calling in. Thank you, everybody at home. Have a wonderful day. I am Mary Alalensu.